welcome to this very full house at ODI. <laughs> and we've got another large number of people in cyberspace watching us uh, and hopefully sending some questions and commentary. My name is Ari Huhtala. I work for CDKN, Climate and Development Knowledge Network. And ODI is one of the five alliance members for CDKN. We are a program funded by the UK DFID and the Dutch DGs to support developing countries in, in their transformation towards what we call climate compatible development paths. So we, our motto is climate compatible development. Today's uh, topic uh, has obviously drawn a lot of people and, 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 and it, it is uh, the political economy of climate compatible development. Uh, we in CDKN and, and many other programs invest a lot of funds and energy in supporting national and subnational policymakers to make more informed choices. And the world is full of good policies and solid evidence, but why do they have an impact in one place and not in the other? And that brings us to the question of political economy. It's about interests, conflicts, intangibles, winners and losers. And why do we want to understand how this works? Well, we uh, should spend our funds and energy much more effi effectively and efficiently to, and design uh, processes that do not ignore the political context and reality of the project and the country and the loca location concerned. So this is really why we're here. We have a very interesting group of, of people to discuss it through uh, that uh, have been working on two CDKN funded programs, uh, taking stock and looking into the political economy of a number of various research projects that we funded earlier, and then a uh, separate uh, exercise by Chatham House on low carbon zones or uh, whatever it's called, you'll, you'll get the details. This is a long morning. Uh, we'll do presentations first, then we'll have some uh, question and answers, and then we'll go to another presentation, uh, have another set of questions and answers, and then we'll have a, a light networking lunch in the other room. I don't want to take more of your time uh, on this. I would like to turn the floor to Tom Tanner, who is now with ODI, but has been wearing another hat uh, while this project was ongoing, and I think it's better that Tom himself explains what the different hats were. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, for eight years I was at the Institute of Development Studies uh, and I joined um, ODI uh, at Easter here to head up the adaptation and resilience team. So I, I speak I, as, as, a, as a generous host but also as a humble researcher. So, uh, um, oh, is that just a title slide? Ah, um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of like, why, why we're interested in political economy. Um, and how we, how we framed the, uh, the three case studies in this research. We're really interested with, with, with CDKN to explore a little bit around getting beyond just technical solutions and the technical assistance-based approach to actually understanding what some of the pathways to change might be, where, where and how might we be able to unlock um, strategies and deliver things that actually can contribute to both climate change and development objectives. That's the wrong uh, one, Leah. Um, where can we uh, where can we contribute to both those objectives, and how can we understand the different groups, the different ideas, uh, and the different institutions that block or facilitate uh, changes that might be able to contribute and then deliver both climate change and development objectives at the same time? That looks like the title slide again. I'm afraid. Overview. It was on the memory stick that I gave you. Okay. Ah. Apologies. Um, well, let me say what it said. Um, <laughs> I guess the... <laughs> <laughs> no. um, the overarching idea really is that climate-compatible development doesn't occur in a political vacuum. That's the, that's the, the, the tweet, the early tweet to get out there. Um, th this assumption that somehow... This is a fairly straightforward process. That, it, that there's technical. It's not there. No, Fine. Sorry. There's there are technical solutions um, for the problems that we face, and that we can do those without understanding that certain people have agendas and um, they're informed by ideologies and they come together with other groups of actors. That's basically what we need to unpack in order to understand what the, some of the structural constraints might be on 
what is actually possible on the ground. Political economy uh, analysis has a lot of different strands, a lot of different versions, um, and we try to distill it down to something fairly easily understood and easily actionable. Um, we've been working with a wide range of researchers who aren't political scientists, um, including most, most, I think, of the researchers. So we're not coming at it from a kind of uh, heavy international relations uh, perspective, present company accepted. Um, so we try to break it down by trying to understand, first of all, what the context was. So unpacking a little bit around the policy context, what are the different competing uh, and interrelated policies around the climate and development objectives? Who are the main groups of actors who are um, influence, influ influential and active in those different uh, policy agendas, whether it be the, the energy lobby on the one hand, or the um, pushing for energy access on a poverty basis, or the climate change people pushing for energy, uh, low carbon energy based on uh, emit uh, emissions reductions. So we try and set out the context, um, and particularly through using the kind of initial parts of stakeholder mapping uh, and uh, literature review, then overlay that a little bit with an understanding of where the, the space is for competition, cooperation, or conflict. So you can use either of the C's you like. Um, I think it's nice to think, I think of it as competition. I think there's, there's a healthy competition between different ideas and different groups pushing different agendas. Um, so obviously the power relations between those different groups and the way those play out in formal institutions but also the more informal ones. So where decision making is actually not uh, codified and, uh, and, and, and out in the open. And then finally, I think from, particularly from, the, from the, the kind of CDKN vision of climate compatible development, we're really interested in the, the consequences. So what are the distributional trade-offs between um, different climate co potential climate compatible development outcomes? Some play into the hands of uh, adaptation, some play into the hands of, uh, of, of mitigation objectives, and some have a strong development driver. And I think within the development driver, you can even see you know, who wins and who loses. Is it uh, equitable? Is it driving poverty reduction? Is it benefiting some groups to the expense of others? And how can you handle those trade-offs? So this, this set of case studies are really looking into those three aspects of the context, the competition, and the consequences of different actions. Um, I think if, you, if we can imagine, I think um, you see on the policy brief, one of our kind of hypo initial hypotheses to set up was the three interrelated circles of adaptation, mitigation, and development. And the nexus in the middle, this triple win sweet spot um, that may or may not exist or may or may not be as, as big as we think. Our essential hypothesis was if you understand the political economy of the opportunities for achieving mitigation, adaptation, and development objectives at the same time. If you can understand the structural uh, constraints and the, the, the processes within which you're embedded, you can actually expand that space. There are more, there's more options available when you actually understand who's driving uh, achieving what and where the competing and potentially cooperative uh, alliances lie. So I'll leave it there um, and introduce um, Professor Peter Newell from University of Sussex, um, who has led, along with colleagues uh, from Kenya, on the Kenyan case study. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, speak directly to it, otherwise people in cyberspace will not hear. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tom. Um, so what I'm talking about now is the, the work we've been conducting over the last period um, with uh, ATPS, the African Technology um, Studies uh, Network. Um, and also with my colleague uh, John Phillips here and, and Anna Bueyo, and we've also got Aisha here from the Kenyan Renewable Energy Association to offer one or two comments and reflections really on, on how the sorts of th findings that we've generated or more broadly how a political economy type analysis might actually be useful uh, to, to practitioners in, engaged in the sorts of issues uh, we're talking about. So the big question um, is this one, really. How is it possible, is it possible, to, for Kenya to simultaneously tackle multiple challenges around energy poverty, uh, climate mitigation, and reducing vulnerability uh, to the effects of climate change? If it can, how can the triple wins that Tom was just referring to uh, be enhanced, and what sort of uh, political changes in particular would be required to, to bring that about? Now, we looked at the case of, of energy and sort of embryonic attempts to, to think about a transition to a lower carbon energy economy 
uh, in Kenya, which is an interesting case study for getting to the real meat of the, of the, the trade-offs around these issues uh, for a whole series of reasons. Partly there are, there are strong hopes, aspirations, ambitions, policies in place to really increase the role of, of renewables in the energy mix. So there's a strong mitigation story to tell. But at the same time, Kenya's been quite heavily reliant on, on hydropower and with uh, climate change and shifts in rainfall variability, there are concerns about reduced vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities to the energy sector aren't just around impacts of climate change, of course, but also around energy price volatility and a whole series of other things. But it's a set of drivers that might make <coughs> renewables more attractive in the Kenyan context. And at the same time, um, there's also huge issues around energy poverty, how to extend the grid, how to make sure that uh, a broader range of uh, poorer people's energy needs are, are met through whichever pathway uh, is pursued. So some of these vulnerabilities, just briefly in a bit more detail, you can think about volatility of, of oil prices, fossil fuel prices more generally that might make renewables attractive, uh, economic vulnerabilities, as well as the, the uh, impact-related vulnerabilities that I mentioned previously. So that clearly is one of the drivers. It's one of the things that features fairly squarely and fairly explicitly in the uh, National Action Plan on climate change and some of the other strategies that have been developed at the national level. But it also has to deal with these uh, concerns around energy poverty. Um, so depending on which figures you look at, uh, it's around 84% of the population that lacks access to electricity. So there's a vast number of people without access to the grid for whom potentially um, renewable options of one sort or another might play a key role. Uh, and I should say that David Ockwell's here and he and Rob Byrne did some very interesting work on solar home systems in the Kenya context. Uh, which you know have been sold as a success story in lots of ways, precisely to tackle these sorts of problems uh, of, of energy access uh, for poorer people. So that's another important part of the of the story. And the baseline in the Kenyan context is quite a positive one. You can see from the, from this diagram that there's big interest in, in geothermal um, by, from on the part of the Kenyan national government, but donors investing heavily in this. Uh, Kenya set up a geothermal development corporation. A bit closer. Uh, the hydro that I mentioned previously and this growing interest in, uh, in solar in particular. Um, and so you can see that there are projections for a, a decarbonisation, a reduction in the carbon intensity of, of Kenya's electricity grid uh, over time. So these, you might think, might be strong, positive, enabling conditions for realising the sorts of uh, triple wins that, that we've been talking about. But we need a, a reality check. There's also growing interest in fossil fuels of one sort or another, in oil, gas, and, and coal. Um, and so the recent oil discoveries in the north of the country have, have excited a lot of interest amongst policy elites and businesses. And therefore, there's, this is a key moment, basically. This, for me, is, gets to the heart of the political economy about which energy future uh, and who will decide which energy future uh, meets those criteria uh, most effectively. And so there's lots of interesting things going on, and we've got a fuller paper, which we have some copies of here on, on the desk, so you know, feel free to take those away. And what we do really is explore in detail some of the politics around how these trade-offs are managed in things like the National Action Plan on Climate Change, which I'll mention again in a moment, uh, the Vision 2030 strategy, but all in the context of a country with a, with a new constitution, uh, where there's a great deal of devolution down to, to county level. And one of the big battles, one of the big political economy battles, is around who wields authority over key decisions about energy, about resource revenue collection between the national government and the counties. So that's something we talk about in the paper. I won't have time to say much more about it uh, today. So this, the, the point is this is a key moment. So three brief examples of political economy in practice and what it, what it can reveal. The first one is Kenya's feed-in tariff, and uh, Aisha, when I finish speaking, may say a word or two uh, about that. I guess externally it's been sold as a success story, and you can see here the UNEP has called it a green economy success story because of the ability to bring down emissions, reduce uh, vulnerability to you know, price volatility around fossil fuels particularly, um, and because of job creation potential. So it's very much framed in those terms that this is precisely the sort of triple win uh, success story that, that, they're, that they're looking for. And yet there's a huge amount of controversy around it. Um, investors claiming that the price for solar particularly is set way too low. Uh, government officials, as you can see uh, in that quote, claiming that some of those concerns are misplaced or exaggerated, and that the government can't afford to lock in uh, very high prices and subsidies effectively for renewable energy providers going forward in a context in which energy prices are already very high. So competing representations about what's the appropriate level to set for that tariff 
uh, and, and who will benefit from the sorts of measures that are being uh, considered. So that's, again, that for us, that's sort of the heart of, of political economy and, and how that plays out. Another interesting example um, is around mobilising business. Clearly, in most of the contexts we're talking about, business will be a key part of whether and how climate compatible development uh, is delivered. In this case, the interesting discussion is around uh, VAT and tariffs on, on solar products, where there was a successful campaign partly led by the Kenyan Energy Renewable Association, uh, which we might hear about in a moment, to get that tariff removed because of the impact it would have on this nascent solar industry. Um, the VAT last year was then reimposed, um, and there was a strong campaign against that, and now again it's been dropped. The point is that this flux, this uncertainty, sends a very weak and poor signal about the direction of change. Um, and in these debates, people often talk about the need for a long, loud, legal signal going to uh, renewable energy investors about the direction of change. And what we've seen here is this sort of pork barrel politics about uh, you know, whether the VAT should be imposed and at what level. So again, it's a, an interesting and, and uh, important case of political economy at work. And the final example I mention is this, this National um, Action Plan on Climate Change, uh, produced in, in 2012 through, <coughs> through quite an open process, quite consultative, quite participatory, trying to bring together all the key ministries and stakeholders. Um, and yet there were concerns that w were um, raised with us uh, amongst interviewees about whether the really powerful ministries were properly involved and really felt any ownership in the process, particularly Ministry of Energy, etc. And so although it was an ambitious attempt to bring the key players together and to, to get some buy-in from this, uh, certain key players, though present, didn't really buy into to the process. And was what resulted then was that the president at the time, Kibaki, um, rejected the attempt to bring about a, a climate change bill uh, because of the way in which it was brought about and, and concerns about whose voice was being represented. So again, in political economy terms, concerns about uh, the, the process and the way in which it was being conducted and who was owning the process of trying to mainstream and integrate climate change concerns into this process. Uh, and that's sort of where the challenge is now. How do you strengthen that institutional uh, and legislative environment and ensure the sorts of uh, broad-based political buy-in that are necessary. And so uh, finally, just one or two reflections on the political economy framework and what it, it can and, and cannot do. One thing I think is it gives some insights into things which you might think are economically or technologically desirable and doable and yet are not happening or are not happening on the scale that people are imagining. Now, that could be around geothermal, it could be around the fuller role for solar in the energy system. There are things which people think are technically, technologically, economically desirable, possible, that are just not happening. So political economy gives you at least one set of resources and insights for, for trying to understand why that's not the case. It also helps you to get inside government, I think, in terms of the bureaucratic trade-offs, the policy networks which operate around these things, which again give you clues as to which sorts of initiatives are likely to be uh, more successful or, or be frustrated. Um, so the process side is, is really important in all of this, but also the role of external actors. I've not mentioned it in this very, very short presentation now, but we deal with it quite extensively in the paper, is the role of donors. And there's a really tricky, delicate challenge there about donors being seen to push the climate side of, of the, the CCD equation, but not take into account sufficiently uh, the other aspects. Uh, and, you know, and uh, sort of the division of labor that tends to emerge where donors might go for the off-grid, smaller scale, uh, lower carbon energy, and state elites perhaps are more interested in the higher carbon <laughs> fossil fuel type trajectory and how those trade-offs are, are worked out in practice. So there's a, an interesting set of tensions about the interaction between internal and external stakeholders, which I think political <coughs> economy analysis uh, helps us to understand. And then finally, I think it's this, it's about what sort of coalitions might be necessary to try and drive this forward. In, a, in our case, thinking about who might win from a lower carbon energy uh, trajectory, what are the sort of industry, government, development NGOs and others that might be brought into a broad-based uh, coalition to, to drive those sorts of things forward. But it also means being realistic and upfront about those that benefit from climate uncompatible development, the very many and very strong vested interests that are doing quite well from uh, a carbon uncompatible development trajectory and what can be done to try and unsettle or challenge uh, the power that those actors have. And so there's more details about, uh, uh, you can download the paper, the briefing, and uh, learn more about the work from, from these website connections. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. There is uh, then a commentary by, by Aisha Abdul Abdulaziz. Uh, if somebody would give you a microphone, please. Aisha well, c comes from the re uh, Kenya Renewable Energy Association. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'd just like to make a very quick uh, summary of the findings of the paper. And um, in our perspective as the Kenya Renewable Energy Association, we feel that uh, such kind of analysis is extremely important because it starts placing emphasis on the other dimensions that we have not been able to address as a sector. Um, these aspects are, you know, the politics around energy access and climate change adaptation, the influence, who has influence, and the extent to which they are able to influence these issues, and of course, um, the aspect of responsibility. Um, if we can't point out who's responsible, then how can we make them accountable, especially to those who are most affected? In this case, in the case of uh, energy access, that being the rural poor. Um, if I just um, add a little bit on the examples um, highlighted by Pete, the VAT value added tax um, exemption, initially gazetted by the government and um, then affected by a blanket removal of VAT in Kenya and then now reinstated. While we are very happy uh, with the fact that it has been, you know, the VAT exemption has been reinstated, um, there is lack of clarity in terms of who made the decision and who influenced that, that decision and what interests are therefore being um, met by such decisions being taken. So if I could just um, highlight the questions around the VAT issue. These are um, the influence of stakeholders, who are they? And what e the extent of their influence on that decision is not very clear. Um, how many interventions were there? Because we imagine that lots of stakeholders in the sector are actively pushing for their own individual or institutional interests. So we um, also don't have clarity on you know, who did what and um, which interventions were effective and which ones were not. And so the question therefore becomes, in the future, um, when we're addressing issues of um, energy access and climate change, how are these decisions being influenced and where interventions are successful, who's you know, investing their time and their contribution towards those goals. And so um, I think that um, in conclusion, <laughs> all these point to an inability to consolidate the various actions that are being carried out in the sector. So there is a lack of predictability. Um, it's quite unclear what the direction of um, you know, the energy access and climate change adaptation and mitigation agenda are. There is a lack of clarity on the policy and on the strategies that are being implemented. There is definitely a lack of um, definition and the lack of agenda setting, especially for the rural um, poor. And so these aspects combined with institutional structures and bureaucracy, institutional mandates, um, the role of individuals within those institutions because whereas power might be assigned to an institution, it might possibly be vested uh, in an individual within that institution and also the level of influence exerted by others who might even be outside, um, you know, such as the donor agencies and their interests. And so if I come back to uh, Pete's starting point, which is on... Um, how greater support can be built. Um, I think the you know, s political economy analysis uh, fits very well into this question because by pointing out um, the areas where power is vested, we might be able to better understand the type of interventions that might enable us to attain modern energy access for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, important <coughs> words like power, uh, responsibility and accountability. These are uh, really the key messages coming out and very interesting details. And I th there's much more in the documentation that is available in printed form uh, on the 
on the table behind us. We will go for questions and answers uh, after the presentation, so let's move directly to a next um, case, which was in Ghana, and that uh, had, uh, was focusing on artisanal fisheries in the coastal areas, and Tom Tanner will give us an inter introduction. Thank you. Um, I should give uh, adequate props to our colleagues who are here from the uh, Institute for Environmental and Sanitation Studies. Um, Adelina, who was going to speak, uh, has throat isn't, isn't feeling uh, that well, so she'll probably lim uh, limit her contribution to the discussion section. Um, I, shall, I shall go over a few of the points that she might have made. Um, clicker. So in Ghana, we focused on the um, marine fisheries sector, which essentially breaks down into, into three sorts of, the fleet breaks down to three sorts of craft. Um, the artisanal canoe-based fisheries um, are I think the dominant one in terms of um, impacts on poverty, and it's the most rapidly expanding part of the fleet. Um, fisheries as a whole contributes to about 1.4% of GDP, which doesn't seem potentially uh, en enormous as a contribution, but it employs uh, around 2 million people in Ghana. So it's, it's really significant, and particularly among uh, the, the lower-income groups. Um, the artisanal fisheries sector has grown rather rapidly, um, in, 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 in recent years, uh, in part due to nece necessity. Um, it's, it's a fairly uh, straightforward industry to get into, and it's relatively cheap to go out fishing, in part due to um, subsidy of fuel for uh, outboard motors. But there's also a semi-industrial, so wh whereas those are the kind of canoe-based fisheries um, that tend to go out for day or potentially overnight, they're also semi-industrial, kind of um, plank-based Boats, it's the way I think about it anyway, as, as an expert in fisheries. Um, the ones that are bigger are made of planks rather than uh, uh, kind of the large canoes. Um, able to stay out um, longer, larger catches, and um, both of those, the artisanal and the semi-industrial fleets, are really limited in terms of how long they can be at sea by um, the amount of ice they can take on board or, or, or the potential to avoid post-harvest losses um, and the amount of fuel they can carry. In contrast, the industrial trawler fleet um, is at sea. You know, these kind of large factory-based boats uh, often they're at sea, can be at sea almost indefinitely, um, coming into fuel infrequently and with you know mass uh, processing and uh, and storage facilities on board. Um, in contrast to the to the other two fleets, they are much more dominated by international trawler fleets. Um, and there are serious, significant issues with uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries uh, within trawlers. And there's been some incidents recently um, of trawlers entering into the coastal zone um, offshore and uh, in Senegal, actually, actually taking action to impound boats. I think it was a Russian boat, which uh, diplomatically is probably a, you know, the top line to get if you want to make uh, make waves across the world about taking. Um, illegal and reported and unregulated fisheries seriously. Um, and the context, I guess, in West Africa is, is really important. There is mass, <coughs> large-scale overfishing. There are declines uh, in fish stocks, and uh, the fishery experts that we spoke to generally spoke of um, the kind of declines as being the sorts of declines that uh, they would characterize as, as, as a crash in fish stocks. Um, so. Large, highly unsustainable, and this graph just shows the difference between um, uh, the, the, the trajectory over time of the development of the, fish, uh, the fishing industry and the brown line at the bottom being um, the collapsed stock relative to uh, uh, in re recent times. And so we're seeing large-scale declines in fisheries due to overfishing, um, due to the number of people fishing, the number of boats, and also uh, the uh, illegal practices, um, including things like net net size, uh, you know, small net size, um, illegal practices like light, fishing with light, fishing with um, uh, dynamite, and, um, and even poison. So the context is really, uh, for, for the climate change impact, o is overlaid onto an existing ecosystem uh, collapse in the fishery stock offshore. But climate change also plays onto a, a wider Ghanaian seascape, and um, it is it is being thought about. 
it's one of the reasons for doing this case study was because <clears throat> there's very, been very little discussion of the kind of fisheries and climate change nexus. In part because the uh, links, as we'll see, aren't aren't direct and uh, very very obvious, but in part because the agriculture sector uh, in Ghana, at least initially, fisheries was subsumed under agriculture in the ministry. So the discussions within climate change policy <coughs> and planning were around agriculture and fisheries. And so agriculture is dominant uh, dominant, and um, tends to take up all the time in the discussions and fisheries gets a little bit lost. Now fisheries has become uh, its, uh, its, its own part of government. <coughs> Excuse me. It's interesting to see that, th th that there was real um, capacity and enthusiasm for discussing climate change and fisheries nexus. So it only plays one part. And I think interesting from a climate compatible development perspective, one of the other major changes in the seascape, uh, along with you know, the, uh, the overfishing and competition and uh, enforcement issues, was actually, is actually the development of oil and gas, offshore oil and gas industry in Ghana. Um, itself with kind of really interesting mixed consequences for, for fisheries. You have, on the one hand, um, the protection of certain areas where fishers can't go. So you have potential breeding grounds around, <laughs> around rigs and offshore equipment. Um, and also the light on those offshore equipment attracts fish too, um, but also the impact of pollution and spills and the growth of you know, algal blooms as a result of um, drilling in particular. Um, so the, the, the impacts, I think, can be uh, summarised in terms of the, um, the impacts on upwelling. So the nutrient upwelling offshore is what, what makes West Coast Gulf of Guinea, Guinea fisheries so uh, nutrient heavy and means that there is this kind of sustained cycle of, uh, of nutrients for fish, particularly uh, kind of pelagic and demersal fish. Um, but onshore, the impacts of coastal, ero coast coastal erosion are really being felt rather profoundly both from kind of sea level rise and from uh, increased storm activity. Um, and that storm damage uh, to, to fishing assets was, was really uh, noticeable in our study. So both damage to fish, uh, to damage to fishing uh, boats and equipment, but also harbours, um, and the effects of adapting to climate change led coastal erosion <coughs> by putting infrastructure-based strengthening measures along the coast actually stops people being able to land their boats. And so you had a trade-off between trying to coastal protection on the one hand, but actually, you know, who, who, who stands to win from that? What's it protecting? Because fish, fishing, uh, fishing vessels' landing sites are being dramatically reduced. Um, rather than waffle on a bit, we made a, made a video about it all. So uh, I thought we'd best to show it um, and take you through some of the some issues in more depth. This project examines the links between coastal fisheries and climate change in Ghana, as there has been little work to date despite the vulnerability of the fisheries sector to climate change. Ghana's coastal fisheries are affected mainly through changes in sea temperature, which affect nutrient upwelling from deep sea to the surface. This has changed fish breeding and reduced stocks, which has had a direct impact on coastal communities, resulting in local people having to find alternative livelihoods. Some people have turned to mangrove cutting in order to make a living, which also has consequences for the environment. The coastal fisheries sector is also a fairly significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions from large-scale industrial fleets and smaller artisanal fishermen. At the start of this project, the research team interviewed policymakers, civil society organisations and researchers with expertise in the coastal fisheries to identify policy interventions that could potentially address climate adaptation, climate mitigation and development issues. We also went to the local community of Anyanwi in the coastal region of Keta to hear the local people's opinions on these issues. Our association with the fishermen, 
I bought them a fish, a fish net. One day, the fish trawler took all away. Our type of fishing is obsolete. We just embark, we look around whether we can see fish. We don't see fish, we come back. 14th century type of fishing is what we're still engaging. But these industrial fleets are there 24-7, January to December. What is going on? We have realized that people now encroach on the wetland by destroying mangroves, which serve as a habitat for fish. So now the, the fish has no place to hide themselves and then breed. Formerly, there's no mangrove farming in this community. When the, the fishing activity is down, now they go to the mangrove farming. Of late, mangroves grow up to the age of 30, 40, thereabouts. It help in preventing storms, but they frequently go into it and then cut it down at the early stage. They don't have fish from the sea to sell to gain money. So they have to turn back to the mangrove and cut them at the early stage to sell as a firewood for the people. After an initial scoping phase, we identified two possible policy interventions. Reductions in premixed fuel subsidies to small-scale fishing boats and enhanced mangrove protection. To further explore the potential of these two intervention ideas, we organised a learning event in Accra with key actors and conducted more interviews in Keta. We found people's opinions on the interventions to be varied and sometimes conflicting. Ordinary fishermen should have access, but then they don't get because you have big and powerful people along the line who of course are also politically connected so they go with their huge containers and they collect most of the problems emanate from the national premix office itself therefore we are calling for the abolition of uh, the national premix committee we are pushing government to register all the canoes so that the canoes once registered with their numbers they can go to the landing beach to buy the uh, premise like the uh, ordinary car buys uh, the fuel dump. With their buy laws, that can help them to preserve the wetland or the mangrove or the, 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 the natural resources. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is difficult since uh, a hungry man is an angry man. The issue of the mangrove is considered as a resource or as a commodity. Yeah, these are, for me, these are the issues that is driving the disappearance of the mangrove. This project has shown us that these interventions are highly political and result in clear winners and losers. This was especially clear with reducing premix fuel subsidies, which, if implemented, could reduce poor people's livelihood options and provoke conflict. We've found that within Ghana's coastal fisheries, development issues are prioritised over related climate issues. Along the coast, options for people to make a living are decreasing. Also, the governance of natural resources such as fish stocks and mangrove are seen to be lacking. These are key issues which have an immediate and direct impact on poverty and hunger. Although the links to climate change are understood by some, for many, they aren't obvious or as urgent. So for this context, it may be more appropriate to identify development policies that provide climate co-benefits. In doing so, reforms can be prioritised so that first and foremost, poor people are given relevant assistance to improve their lives and livelihoods in a changing climate. So we um, need to talk very briefly about the, uh, those two examples. Um, the premix fuel subsidy case is, is, is really interesting. It's, it's something that's politically really contentious, and we had uh, a lot of... It was interesting to research, because we had to come across like we weren't actually pushing this as you know, a normative. This should happen. 
Um, and I think uh, you know, that those from from ISS were, were similarly minded as well. I'm rather scared of that. It's um, this subsidised uh, engine fuel for the artisanal craft is was exempt from the, the removal of fossil fuels subsidy elsewhere, and you know that's that's seen as internationally there's a lot of pressure um, for removing fossil, fossil fuel subsidy as a key objective. And it was justified in, in Ghana because of its uh, livelihood impact of, of retaining it there. Um, the question then, could, could the removal tackle overfishing, adapt livelihoods and reduce emissions? The strength of that, of that, that lobby uh, on, uh, to local livelihoods and the ability of the Canoe Fishermen's Association and the, and the Association of Chief Fishermen to lobby government to prevent that uh, subsidy being removed is really, really high. There's a lot of voters there. There's a lot of uh, vested local interest and, and political support. Um, interestingly, though, the government is basically doing it by stealth. So gradually, it, in, incre in price increases on other fuels, it's, it's over-increasing um, those on, on the premix. And it actually had a 20% reduction in that subsidy um, uh, about a year ago, which caused some outcry. And um, according at least to some newspaper reports, actually did lead to less, less boats being on land. Um, there's a general distrust among fishermen for kind of compensation measures, the idea of actually hypothecating the, the savings that you would make from that uh, subsidy removal and using it to somehow compensate fisher folk and, uh, and develop other livelihoods in, in the coastal zone um, was really you know, the experience is that it doesn't tend to happen. I think the experience internationally of any kind of hypothecation or, you know, allocation of uh, particular savings to, to the fiscal reserve don't tend to happen. Um, also, I think the wider questions around blame, like who do you blame for the, over, for, for the overfishing and the, and the fish collapse? Um, the, the different narratives we heard around whether it's to do with illegal practices, whether it's to do with the, uh, the influence of trawler fleet, or there's just too many people out in the ocean. I mean, it's not clear how that then maps onto climate change impacts on upwelling. So the research around upwelling and the changes in nutrients is still only in its kind of formative stages. But to, do, to be able to do the kind of detection and attribution uh, is extremely difficult. I think we, you know, we, we unpack some of that in the, in the working paper around the contributions of, kind of illegal practices, uh, in, influence of trawler fleet and sheer numbers. But then the, the changes to upwelling um, aren't really that well understood. Although biophysically they are, you know, in, in increasing sea surface temperatures and, uh, and salinity affect the, uh, the strength of that upwelling process and therefore reduce nutrient, load, nutrient loads. Um, and overall, the political economy questions around, uh, around climate change and fisheries, the, the dominance of uh, a mitigation agenda uh, has been really kind of thrown out by the government that says, you know, adaptation is our core need. Um, we shouldn't really be doing the climate compatible development for the sake of uh, mitigation objectives. Where they are coherent with development objectives, that's fine. But really, we're interested in the development side and in the uh, and the adaptation side. And you know, this, this kind of um, intervention is actually quite insignificant in terms of emissions uh, if it's just about the uh, artisanal fleet. The um, the uh, manufacturing and processing side and the industrial fleet have a much higher uh, footprint. But that itself is really insignificant if you compare it to the development oil and gas industry. If, if, if those oil and gas reserves are exploited, far outweighs um, those kind of reductions. On the mangrove protection side, I think we all know the, the cause celebre of the mangroves, you know, the, the quadruple win, because you have biodiversity as well. Um, <laughs> and I think, the, 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 as an outsider, the, the, my, my sense was that those what we consider from in the climate community is, oh yeah, we have mangroves, here we go again, heard it all before. You know, they're great for lots of reasons, but it doesn't tend to happen. Actually, you know, nationally and locally, those, those understandings of the multiple benefits of mangroves um, weren't as dominant. They weren't as, 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 as uh, obvious to, to, to local and, uh, and some of the stakeholders in our, in our learning event. Um, there's a kind of combined issue on the destruction between people doing it out of necessity because of poverty and, and the unsustainable harvesting around that and also the clearance of mangroves for industrial and commercial development 
and it's common to, to many parts of the world. Um, I think what's, what's interesting is actually that underpinning the governance is not just the, 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 the poor ability to regulate uh, protected sites, but actually the ability to do so is, is really constrained by the mixture of different land tenure arrangements. And actually, some of the incentive structures are driving sustainable harvesting. So there's quite a lot of private ownership of mangroves in, in Ghana, unlike some other countries. Um, but the benefits of those, uh, of those mangrove stands need to be internalized in terms of you know, sustainably harvesting them. So by necessity, people are having to cut them down. And I think that balance between, um, that we explored a little bit in the paper around pushing for regulatory control and greater you know, delimitation of, of reserves, and uh, I mean the Ramsar sites that have all been um, delimited there are not being enforced, and that's partly because of that the, the lack of clarity around um, the mandates for governing and regulating those sites. And this is an issue for the coastal zone as a whole. You know, where does where does one ministry or one department's regulatory control begin, and where does it end when you get to the coast and, and the kind of and the, and the inland sites that link the the coast and the and the sea. Um, I think one thing we bring out in, in, in the paper that was, that was really interesting was actually to understand climate compatible development as slightly more dynamic, as saying over time, um, these, the contributions of different development mitigation and adaptation objectives change over time. So uh, while it makes a, a lovely diagram uh, that Professor Gordon put together in, uh, from, from IESS, this, it's really illustrated quite well in terms of overfishing. You know, if we want to protect livelihoods and adapt livelihoods to, to, to climate change in the longer term, we need to stop overfishing now. But that's going to have some serious and, and immediate consequences on um, poverty and development and livelihoods in the short term. Um, so that trade-off is not just between different groups of people, but actually a trade-off over time, taking action now in order to secure futures, um, uh, viable uh, future livelihoods in, uh, down the line. And finally, just uh, uh, as, as with Pete, this is, um, so I was, uh, I'm sure the um, colleagues from Ghana will reflect on this too, but some of the, the idea of breaking it down into these three Cs was certainly simple and easy to enact. It, 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 I don't think it lost um, too much of the complexity of political economy and all the different theoretical strands, but it, it certainly uh, brought new perspectives both to our, the, us as researchers but I think importantly um, to those we spoke to and those who were at the learning event, um, they, they saw things in ways they hadn't done before and it actually opened their eyes to this kind of new <coughs> nexus, which I think the, the learning there was around just understanding who the different actors are when a new policy space emerges. So when you actually link a fairly new issue like climate change with an existing policy space, um, it opens up a whole new set of issues and problems and and dilemmas, but it also creates opportunities for new alliances um, to take action. And actually doing political economy analysis enables, helps people to understand who is positioned where, who might be um, for or against something, and where the vested interests, um, or uh, I don't like to term vested interests, it always sounds bad. We all have vested interests. We've all invested in certain things and we push certain things. Um, but the challenge is then speaking to that policy change. So as we, uh, as we have done with, with this and the, and the other case studies, understanding those trade-offs and the structural constraints that allow us to do certain things or others or allow us to, would, would lead us to try and work with different people to unlock um, their willingness to change or the incentives that, that drive them to change. Then taking that, the political economy analysis forward I still find tricky. I'm honest as a researcher. I want to change the world. But you know, how does politics speak to policy? And how does political economy speak to policy is still a real challenge for me. So using these results to actually advocate for specific, specific changes. And I think you know, as researchers, we kind of think, we th as action-based researchers, we want to do that. But it, maybe it's just like opening up the landscape to allow you know, particular advoc advocacy groups to be able to, or interventions, to be able to target more effectively and work out um, what's realistic in terms of what they can achieve. Thanks. Thank you very much. I believe, what did I understand correctly? Adelina is not speaking now. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 
it was no, thanks for the film. It was actually refreshing to see people who are affected and who are actually sort of giving opinions. I also, it, it's interesting that you mentioned quadruple fins, uh, f wins, very rare. I think triple wins are quite rare. It's, we have to be very honest about this and, and sort of try to target, for, look for co-benefits and not only sort of dream of triple wins only because that's probably not going to be easy. Anyway, let's go to the third case. I should mention, of course, uh, just as a host, the, uh, the videos will be online. That and two other videos, they're still works in progress. Uh, they will be they will be online shortly, um, including an introduction to um, political economy analysis, the Ghanaian case, and then a video that summarizes the results of all three case studies. And n now we'll go to Mozambique. Julian Kwan from Natural Resources Institute will talk about our findings on Red Plus and carbon forestry in Mozambique. Okay, thank you. Well, as uh, Ari just said, our study focused on the potential application of political economy analysis to the forest sector, in particular carbon forestry in Mozambique and the prospects for the Red Plus program. I'm not quite sure how, how are we working here. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, I'll briefly present uh, some background on Red Plus climate compatible de development um, and the relevance of political economy analysis and then concentrate on the findings from our study in Mozambique and some conclusions, implications for how Red Plus might go forward uh, and for the utility of uh, political economy analysis in this context. So firstly on our framework and background, uh, Red Plus reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. As some of you may know, it's a global system for carbon-based payments which is intended to provide incentives to governments and forest users to conserve or increase forest cover. Um, it's morphed from an emphasis simply on forest conservation to the plus, uh, which signifies really the potential inclusion of, if you like, uh, market-based carbon forestry, the production of carbon credits, but also a range of other potential interventions which could help increase forest carbon stocks uh, through tree planting, reducing pressure on natural forests, agroforestry, etc., changing agricultural practice, reduce, reducing energy demand, etc., etc. Uh, although primarily carbon forestry and Red Plus has been conceived as a, a mitigation measure that provides opportunities for new revenue generation and business, but obviously this could also potentially assist in poverty reduction, uh, could potentially assist in strengthening the resilience of forest-based agroecosystems and livelihoods, depending on the models that are applied, and as such it's potentially very, very relevant to uh, climate compatible development. So uh, we applied uh, <coughs> experimentally, really, <coughs> political economy analysis techniques to try to assess what kinds of outcomes might be achieved in practice and what they might be for different groups. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Red Plus has generated an enormous quasi-academic industry which is really concentrated on carbon measurement, reporting and verification, and on the other hand, on the design of carbon finance mechanisms and payment systems with relatively little progress on the ground. Now in this context in the international debate it's something that has proved really quite controversial uh, because of concerns about the impact of previous forest uh, conservation efforts which created <coughs> subsidies and incentives for elites, displaced indigenous people, may have accelerated biodiversity loss, promoted, actually promoted the substitution of national, natural forest with, with plantations, locking farmers into uh, inequitable agreements with man management companies, an emphasis on the global carbon credit market, enabling polluters to buy their way out of emissions reduction, and a general ethical opposition to the commodification of nature. Uh, coupled with the current failure and decline of the, 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 the carbon market. So in this context, the context of multiple changes and stress, the focus on mitigation through Red Plus programs may be making unacceptable trade-offs with negative consequences for the poor, raising real questions about how you really blend market and non-market mechanisms, how you protect tenure rights, how you do good forest governance in practice. Um, a useful framework for considering what sort of interventions uh, what kind of impact different types of inter forest interventions might have on climate compatible development looks at um, along the x-axis um, what type of intervention is it about natural forest protection or about planting new forests to accumulate carbon and what degree of community inclusion or exclusion there is I mean, the classic models on the back of conventional forestry in terms of large-scale plantations on the other hand large-scale conservation uh, moving up 
uh, the whole history of community forestry, social forestry, joint forest management, agroforestry, community farmer managed woodlots. In relation to each of these, it's possible to pose questions about what the impacts are on different different aspects of climate compatible development. So the poverty impact, the impact on economic growth, the risk of capture by elites, uh, the actual benefits that might be provided for ecosystem protection or for carbon accumulation, the actual impact it may have on mitigation in the broader context, etc., etc. So we found that to be quite a useful framework in which to situate interventions and to understand what kinds of effects they might have on, on climate compatible development. Uh, as regards political economy uh, in the context of the broader broader project, we, we used the focus on, on context, competition, collaboration or conflict between different actors and the consequences, the distributional outcomes. So looking at various aspects of the background uh, on forest resource use in Mozambique, the role and influence of different actors in the policy process institutional framework, the competing narratives used, competing interests of, and power relations amongst the different actors, and the distributional consequences. Uh, and indeed, uh, the implications for what sorts of alignments and coalitions of act actors are promoting particular types of interventions or are resisting change or, or promoting certain approaches. Um, so as regards our findings, I think in the broader context, Mozambique is a very low-lying country with a long coastline. It's highly vulnerable to the effects of, of climate change. Forests continue to be a very important resource. Um, they cover forest or secondary forest of some kind or other covers 50% of the land area roughly. Deforestation has been estimated at a relatively low rate, um, although it's still quite significant. I think these figures don't really take into account forest degradation. And most likely, given the multiple drivers on deforestation, that rate is increasing. But they remain a major resource for both livelihoods and economic development. The current forest management system is relatively weak, centering around a licensing and concession system, increasingly simple licenses which can be awarded at almost any administrative level, and the risk of vested interests and deals with forest, forest users, the increase in small-scale forest exploitation, but which is linked to major regional trade in, uh, in charcoal to feed urban markets, and also the international trade in timber, particularly with the Chinese. So instead of concessions, it's moving, it has moved towards a more unregulated uh, licensing system now. So in this context, red plus interventions, depending on how they're framed and conceived, could really address different aspects of climate compatible development to improve forest management and the consequences, the outcomes for different groups. Um, I think the agrarian context is worth mentioning, the sheer scale of demographic pressure on land and, land and forest resources. Uh, Mozambique's people are highly reliant on, on, on extensive, low technology, small scale farming, shifting cultivation, but under democratic, uh, demographic pressure, con more and more concentrated within relatively confined areas. And there's a very strong official narrative on the negative impacts of agricultural practice and the need for intensification and, and, and the, the impact that agriculture and livelihood practices by the poor have on forests. Now, this is, this is contestable, but undoubtedly these factors do play a role. But um, although the forest directorate in Mozambique is located within the Ministry of Agriculture, there's actually been relatively little progress on the ground. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric around sustainable agricultural intensification, but so far little progress. Uh, Large-scale land acquisitions have, have, have risen. Um, although you've got a, a background of quite progressive lawmaking co and community consultation in Mozambique, some quite progressive laws, the land law aspects of the forest law, the institutional frameworks for implementation are very weak. And the consequence has been increasing land conflict between farming communities and investors, uh, particularly in relation to forest land and forest plantations. For Red Plus itself, uh, the wave of large-scale land acquisitions led to proposals from private operators and global conservation agencies combined, which total around 30, over a third of Mozambique's land area. So there was very, very huge interest in the last few years in the potential of it. Now, in this context, Mozambique's tried to set up policy and institutional framework for managing Red Plus. Ironically, there are two uh, lead government players, the Ministry of for environmental coordination, which is the lead player in global finance and climate uh, negotiations, uh, and the department, the directorate for, for forest management. Uh, now, these agencies don't really seem 
see entirely eye to eye. MICOA, the Environment Ministry, is primarily interested in Mozambique's contribution to global mitigation and the opportunities that Red Plus provides for revenue generation, including for the ministry itself. Um, Whereas the forest department is much more interested in, in getting resources to improve forest management, which includes dealing with farmers, dealing with stakeholders. However, in practice, this has been a, a relatively low political priority in the countries, is looking to the Red Plus process and in global climate finance resources in order, in order to fund this. There's a range of other players who've not really been, who, who've making significant contributions on the ground in some areas, but are not, have not really been significantly engaged in the policy process. And there's been considerable criticism, particularly from civil society, on lack of transparency, lack of consultation, and the, the fact that the Red Plus process seems to be driven by, uh, in particular, by the World Bank, uh, Global Forest Partnership Fund, and other global players rather than national actors. Um, in order to manage this situation, the government has recently introduced a Red Plus legislation, a decree which was mainly oriented at managing the, the, the demand for large-scale Red Plus projects and finance. Um, so it set up, it set up a centralised licensing process. So this is only just starting to run. It hasn't really operated yet, but centralised licensing with really quite complex approval and compliance procedures focused on fees, taxes, potential for revenue generation and benefit sharing. Uh, ironically, it has no real impact. The law has no impact on existing forest management legislation or institutions. So if you like business as usual outside of Red Plus project areas, which is causing the degra degradation and impacting on livelihoods, uh, could in principle carry on as business as usual outside the Red Plus framework. Um, there's no requirement for Red Plus operators to actually obtain land concessions, but given the way the projects are conceived uh, and how they would be funded, they're likely to require a very high degree of control. Um, there's a set of competing narratives in Mozambique which more or less mirror the narratives that there are about Red Plus globally. Uh, it's either an seen as an opportunity for results-based progress to reduce deforestation, generate revenue. That's probably the dominant view from MICOA, uh, from the private sector, from government. Uh, on the other hand, quite a vociferous critique from civil society organizations linked to global networks like Via Campesina and Friends of the Earth International, which is completely and implacably opposed because of the risk that Red Plus will undermine livelihoods, uh, promote land grabs, etc., etc. So that's quite an influential critique. On the other hand, there seems to be a growing group of actors, uh, not just uh, within civil society, but linked to academic institutions, international institutions, donors and government, which sees Red Plus as a possible instrument for good, depending on the certain conditions, depending on what kinds of projects uh, are implemented in practice, what degree of stakeholder and community participation there is. So we found that this appears to be a growing grouping, if you like, an expanding middle ground. On the other hand, there's been relatively little progress in practice. Um, these perspectives on Red Plus don't clearly align with, with <coughs> private sector, government, civil society. Um, so um, there is a, a, a a group of actors who, if you like, occupy that middle ground, which involves Eduardo Mangalan University, our, our, colleague, Eduardo, uh, our colleague Almeida Sitoy, who's here, I hopefully can say a few words after this presentation, um, IIED and a number of important national uh, environmental and development NGOs who are involved in uh, a process of trying to pilot or test Red Plus interventions working alongside government and who have Norwegian funding support. And there's potential for shifting views and alliances in this context. Um, interestingly, Red Plus is very much intertwined with debate and contestation of other aspects of domestic policy, land policy, forest policy, uh, energy policy, agricultural practice, etc., the role of investment. But the debate about Red Plus almost takes place in a bubble, in a bubble with a fairly closed group of actors. And, and ironically, it's not, broad, not connected to the broader climate change debate in Mozambique, in particular about adaptation. There's an elephant in the room in Mozambique, which is the rapid increase in the level of fossil fuel exploitation, which, if you like, highlights the issue of Mozambique's perhaps own responsibility uh, to mitigate its own emissions, uh, the potential large-scale thermal power generation, although Mozambique is full of renewables. Um, so there's a big macro issue here about, uh, about carbon balance and energy strategy, which really the Red Plus debate and debates about climate change adaptation as a whole in Mozambique don't really yet touch. 
I'll try and skate through this rapidly, but just to say there's a range of types of conflicts between small-scale land users uh, and uh, forest plantations, uh, forest investors, uh, and to some extent private operators I in the conservation sector. Uh, Community-based natural resource management schemes have tended to break down. Uh, extensive commercial logging and, and charcoal production on community land, competition between small-scale farmers and investors. On the other hand, there's a growing amount of experience where communities are assisted to delimit and register their land rights, to develop um, natural resource management committees, small-scale community-based <coughs> forest natural resource businesses, legal empowerment, etc., has led to quite a wide range of practical examples of community-based forest management small-scale businesses, outgrow woodlots, etc., fire reduction, uh, small-scale forest industries, honey production, etc., etc. So there is a lot of positive experience uh, which could develop. Um, there are community forests. This is an example. This community is actually excluding others, excluding uses except where authorised by the elders. There may be elements of elite capture, but uh, re certain resources are being preserved by communities in certain places. Uh, referring back to the, the two axes on which projects could be situated, uh, it's not really just a question of either or large-scale conservation or plantations or community-based uh, enterprises. Uh, there are various ways in which projects can, be, can, can do bits of both, community-managed woodlots, agroforestry, uh, outgrow a tree production, etc. And indeed, these may need to be situated within a mosaic, particularly if you're talking about large-scale uh, red plus project. So there'll be a need for quite pluralistic approaches which promote community engagement. How long have I got? A couple of minutes? Or? Okay, cheers. Uh, one project in particular, really the only concrete example that we found, which is not red plus but linked to the voluntary carbon market, is a, a project which we've situated hovering in the middle of those axes, the Safala Carbon Project, operated by the originally a UK-based project called Envirotrade. Now, this is quite pioneering in that it linked tree planting and agroforestry by local farmers to improved natural forest management and the accumulation of, of, of carbon credits, uh, carbon payments to farmers, certain benefits for the wider community, carbon credits sold on the voluntary carbon market. That was the, if you like, the aspiration at the beginning. A certain amount of venture capital went in uh, to finance the initial carbon payments. Uh, communities were given secure land rights, so their land wasn't alienated. So there seems to be here scope for triple win to assist both development, poverty reduction, uh, carbon mitigation, uh, climate mitigation, and perhaps assist in adaptation as well. Uh, in practice, the story's been rather different in that really because of the low level of finance available from the carbon market itself, uh, Envirotrade front-loaded the carbon payments in the first seven years. So farmers were doing quite well, but we're talking really about a 30, 40, 50 year horizon for carbon accumulation without any guarantees whatsoever um, that uh, sustainability could be maintained. During this time, the carbon price fell quite dramatically uh, and investor interest fell off. Um, the project's estimated that really where the carbon is being accumulated is in natural forest. So it's about preserving or even extending natural forest and better natural forest management, whereas the carbon payments that were linked to the, linked to the voluntary carbon market went into small-scale <coughs> agroforestry, really. But it's really, that's only going to make about 20% of the difference. So 80% of the carbon, they estimate, uh, is coming from natural forest. Yet... Uh, in order to help preserve that natural forest, create more sustainable management, sustainable community-based forest industries, uh, and spread the benefits more broadly, apart from the, the agroforestry farmers, um, the project was reliant on an EU grant. Uh, so the carbon market alone could not support it. It really raises questions about how you blend market and non-market mechanisms in Red Plus, and the EU found there had been quite serious difficulties with carbon measurement, particularly in natural forest, and risks of elite capture of the project. Um, so that was really the only pioneering example we found, and some important messages from that and from our findings, really. Red Plus is still up for grabs in Mozambique. Um, People, players are acknowledging the need for community participation, more decentralised planning, but no mechanisms in practice really to do it. Red Plus is poorly integrated with the broader climate development agenda. Procedures are complex. They don't really provide clear incentives either for communities or the private sector to participate strongly. Land governance is central and needs to be strengthened in order to safeguard the rights of forest communities and provide a, a framework in which land rights could be managed in a more adaptive way. 
uh, landscape territorial development approaches <coughs> need to come together to enable better informed, more decentralized, more participatory, participatory planning across multiple land units because in, in practice, very, very large scale projects except in extremely remote areas, are rather unlikely. And institutional reform and capacity building is needed to improve forest management and change the political incentives to do forest management better. There's a lot of concern that at a high level there are these vested interests really in forest resource exploitation that ultimately government may not really be interested in putting a more secure forest management regime in place. So it's very worrying. Uh, a few ideas and concepts which really need more analysis where political economy can help. Uh, climate compatible development in rural Mozambique is likely to depend on, on solid frameworks for, for regional local economic development and territorial governance within which forests and Red Plus are going to be nested. We need adaptive land rights management in the context of rapid economic and climate change. Uh, and we need to look at sustainable landscape mosaics rather than single forests under one controller uh, who can control the carbon that accumulates in them. And it's important to, to look at how these approaches and practical in interventions are framed, what the outcomes are for different groups. Um, reflecting on the utility of political economy analysis, well, the main focus on this was a policy process. It was kind of anticipatory in that Red Plus hasn't really happened yet on the ground. Uh, and so it was forward looking with few practical examples to look at. Now, political economy is, is potentially much, much broader than that. I think we were conscious that the links with the broader national analysis of political economy and ecology, not only about forest, forest resources, but rural investment, energy policy, fossil fuel exploitation, the role of national and global institutions and coalitions in pushing the economy in one direction or another is actually critical. So on the one hand, it needs to link up, get out of a sectoral point of view, link up to a broader national picture, but also come down to the ground and look at how does this how does this sit side by side with our knowledge of what's going on with the biophysical processes, with the state of the forest resource, um, the levels of carbon that can be accumulated, uh, but also to focus down onto particular regional or local scenarios and look at the activities and capacities uh, of different groups, how actor coalitions work on the ground to produce, to develop projects which could in principle meet climate compatible development objectives and can be more inclusive uh, of the poor. And that's where political economy analysis I think is potentially very, very relevant in terms of linking empirically what's going on on the ground and the broader dynamics, the broader drivers of the overall economy and how climate compatible it is. So thank you very much for your patience and if we have time it would be great to hear a few words on how the process is going and the problem of sustaining forest management in Mozambique from Professor Almeida Sitor. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Brief commentary indeed from, from, uh, Mr. S uh, well, from Almeida Sitor, please, if you can give the microphone. Yeah, good morning. Uh, um, just want to add a few comments uh, that results mainly from the, this study. Looking specifically on the lessons that we learned from using this uh, tool of political economy analysis for to evaluate especially the the red plus conditions of success uh, also taking into consideration the the role of the sustainable forest management as a key role in the in the red process uh, i have a few points to 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 indicate in this in this context, the first one is uh, related to the forest governance, which has been uh, indicated in this study that uh, needs to be very well focused, especially looking into aspects like uh, the forest legislation, which is most in most of the cases very well designed in Mozambique, but at the same time uh, little or reduced level of implementation, resulting in most of the time in um, illegal logging. So something has to be done uh, seriously in this aspect to make sure that uh, things can happen in the reality. Uh, the second thing is um, related to the biophysical and socioeconomic uh, understanding, the, the baseline on which uh, all those aspects are happening need to be understood. Uh, we are still uh, in the process of uh, understanding the, the aspect of quantifying the, the, the carbon in our forest and the dynamics related to, to the 
forest uh, degradation and uh, deforestation. But also we still need to understand the underlying ca causes of deforestation because uh, people chop down forests for some reason and uh, they won't stop doing that unless we give them uh, alternatives which are acceptable for, for those people who live out of that. So uh, based on those two aspects, I have uh, the third aspect is that, uh, well, we have a situation which we need to change. So the first and most important thing is that uh, if we need uh, to change the, the, the business as usual scenario, then first we need to have a willingness to change. Uh, that needs uh, commitment of uh, institutions, of people, and all the stakeholders involved in the process. Uh, this means, in practice, the policy integration uh, in different sectors, not only in the forestry, but on the land, legislation, energy, and uh, agriculture, and also the coordinated investments. Um, also, integration of community forest-based initiative, in particular, uh, especially considering the, the legal conditions in <coughs> Mozambique. Uh, the fourth aspect that I would like also to mention is the, the need to point out the entry points that uh, already exist and can be explored actually to uh, enter or initiate the process of uh, uh, bringing uh, to reality the red aspects. Those include the, the large-scale investments in agriculture and also the forest plantation, which are growing uh, a lot in Mozambique, uh, but also the community forest plantations, uh, including agroforestry systems. And uh, uh, in this uh, uh, aspects, includes including particularly the, the presidential initiative to plant forests at the community level and also the community carbon projects uh, like, like uh, conservation agriculture, improved charcoal uh, stoves, uh, the use of natural gas as household energy. It has been mentioned how um, the discoveries of um, uh, fossil fuels has been growing in, in Mozambique. And uh, the last is that uh, the lessons that we have learned from this uh, political economy analysis uh, throughout this process brings us the point that, that we need to merge the agendas to make this a uh, reality. So development, adaptation, and mitigations uh, are key issues that can, uh, as far as possible, try to merge their agendas so that this can be a uh, reality. And the sustainable forest management is just one, but important of the entry points um, and need coordination with other sectors out of the forestry sector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. This has been a qu quite a range uh, from energy poverty, uh, fishermen's interests, uh, now forest dwellers. Uh, it, uh, lots of uh, food for thought. I would not allow, uh, like to invite Fateh Marajbali from IDS to kind of summarize a little bit. What do you make out of this? How do you learn out of this? How do you communicate to the outside world? Um, thank you, Ari. Um, I, you've heard quite a few presentations, and I'm sure you're ready to have a Q&A now, so I'll try and keep this as short as possible. Um, but um, I come in from a very different angle. I'm actually interested in, l we were, as part of a team, interested in looking at how can we make this research learning actually count? So it's embedding a learning and research uptake process throughout the project cycle. And why do this? Well, the opportunity is to really support, um, you have to play it first. Oh, sorry, okay, you want to get in. That's great. Okay, 
um, is to actually um, support an evidence-based um, decision-making process. So, you know, we're, the research is available. It's all really interesting and exciting. But what can we actually make of it in terms of making it accessible, usable um, for different types of audiences? Thinking about that, we actually uh, came together um, right at the inception of the project. And one of the key questions we asked was, well, what change do we actually want to see in the world as a result of this project? And through that, a number of objectives emerged, one of which is about supporting a research process which is open where uh, to different stakeholders being brought together and actually having a collective learning experience. Um, that could be done in a variety of different ways, of which I'll describe a little bit later. Another was about integrating participatory approaches to map out and engage with these different stakeholders. So each of these research leads have talked about bringing together different actors, the different types of conversations that unfolded, how they actually found out who had vested interest in what. Well, that means actually bringing them together and, ha and conducting participatory ways of getting them to talk. So um, we were interested in, in engaging in that process. Another is about, well, we we're putting all these really kind of interesting um, documents together, but how can we actually curate and repackage it so it's much more accessible, but it's also much more usable in the real world? Um, having thought about, having gone through these objectives, we wanted to put in a process where we could actually make this a little bit more a reality. We did this by engaging with the researchers right from the beginning of the project. Um, so it was about you know, putting in a process in place where we were included in the conversations and decisions that were going to kind of happen for these various case studies. We wanted to investigate various sort of participatory methods and approaches that could be used to support um, stakeholder mapping, influence mapping, power mapping, all the, the kind of important sort of components in being able to extract the right type of information. Uh, we wanted to identify opportunities to have these learning events that uh, each of these research leads um, kind of help facilitate. Um, and that meant actually understanding who are the stakeholders that needed to be brought together. So we, um, you know, there was a a thinking through um, of um, going through a mapping process where we will be able to identify who the key actors are in the respective um, case studies. Um, and then, of course, the curating bit, you know, like uh, my colleague um, who developed some of the video, who has developed the videos rather, um, actually had to think through, um, well, we're going to, ha we're going to put conduct and put all this research together. Where do I need to be? Who do I need to speak to in order to be able to put together these, do um, these various sort of multimedia um, products? That's part of a process as well that requires investment in time and resources. So the learning events were actually really interesting because they actually it supported us to bring together relevant actors, but to also facilitate some really um, difficult dialogue sometimes. So for example, um, the one case study that I was more heavily involved in was Ghana, was actually bringing together different types of methods where we were able to actually get people to talk to one another. And that can be quite difficult um, because people have different interests and not everybody's willing to be honest in a room. And um, it also meant that we could actually go into the field as well and talk to people on the ground. So have a bit of a reality check of, well, this, this is what different researchers and policy advisors feel. But actually, the people who are living with these challenges on the ground, how are they experiencing it? Uh, so it, it brought an array of different actors um, into a room, but it also meant that it needed to be kind of facilitated in a way that was engaging. So for example, in the Mozambique case study, we realized that we couldn't actually be there if we, didn't, if we couldn't speak Portuguese, because the, the whole event needed to be facilitated in Portuguese. So those were the kinds of, um, some of the kind of small little challenges that you face without you know, the assumptions you make that I'll go in, I'll be able to do it, but actually taking a step back and realizing that there are a number of different elements that need to be thought through before um, undertaking some of these activities. Um, th we, we clearly had some overarching objectives as part of these learning events. We wanted people to have a better understanding of political economy analysis. Um, and that was 
something that I think all the research leads try to do in those various sort of events. Another was about actually creating a conducive environment for those conversations to happen and to be mm -hmm. able to capture relevant data um, for further sort of interviews and for further sort of analysis um, as part of um, the on sort of ongoing work that's going to happen even after this research project is over. Um, so um, we helped facilitate some of those kind of processes as well. And then of course it was about identifying, potentially identifying interventions. And that meant um, bringing key actors, mapping it out, but then what happens from now? You know, how do we actually put in climate compatible development interventions? Where are the starting points? Who do we need to be speaking to make that a reality? Oops. <laughs> Can I go to yeah. Right, so we're very fortunate to have in this room a number of partners from those respective countries and, and partner organizations with us today. So we will be continuing to have this conversation. This afternoon we'll be having an event, um, an internal event where we'll be able to share some of the learning that each of these researchers uh, experience by doing their, their various case studies. So this kind of cross case study analysis uh, will help us think through how was this political economy framework actually uh, useful? Were there any sort of differences and commonalities to be found? Were there actually challenges that we hadn't thought about? Were there things that we should have actually embedded right from the beginning? Were there components that, um, that didn't make sense for that co specific country? Um, another is about capturing relevant data so that we can do some interesting things with it, including a synthesis paper which will be coming out in the next couple of months. So we've brought all this data together, we've, brought, we've conducted these events, there are lots of different things that have um, been kind of compiled and collated. What do we do with it? Well, we spoke to researchers and we worked with a number of different sort of partners to try and bring together this content in a variety of dynamic ways, of which include mm -hmm. blogs, um, which are available for everyone to access uh, through, I think, the CDKN website now. Um, and, of, and of course, to without uh, trying to kind of under emphasize the use of uh, blogs and, and social media, it's incredibly important to also have um, events like this where there's opportunity to have a face-to-face -face sort of dialogue with people who are interested in issues like this. So not only are we communicating what uh, the different sort of usage of political economy analysis, um, it's also an opportunity to exchange ideas um, and potentially explore new ways of working on these issues. Um, but, in a, but because we have so many different types of products, including the videos, the blogs, the commentaries, the publications, we, wanted, we were basically kind of thinking about, well, what, how can we make this much more accessible? What, what ways can we bring this together so it is a better use to a wider group of people? The type of language we're using in this room, I think, is it, it's kind of very limited to a niche group of people. There are lots of uh, development professionals and climate change professionals out there who will start, who will start to, uh, to think about political economy analysis in the work, or who need to be thinking more about political economy analysis. So we decided to actually repackage some of this content uh, by developing training packs. So the aim of the training pack is to really strengthen understanding of political economy analysis um, of climate compatible development. So you know, what is this all about? Why is this useful? What is the point of actually reflecting and thinking about these issues? And the initially, we're going to be just aiming it at teachers and trainers, and we're hoping to kind of direct them towards academic and training institutions. Um, and by developing, by using the videos, we want to actually try and develop very clear learning outcomes by actually providing an overview of what is this all about, but also getting, um, we're going to come together and actually ask questions that will help the students reflect upon the key issues. Um, essay questions to actually go back, you know, to have a classroom sort of set up where you can actually have the kind of dialogue around um, um, political economy analysis, and, but also, more importantly, to actually develop project planning sort of um, 
ideas so that there's a much more practical engagement of what this actually means. So we've done a lot, we've done this over the, over the course of the past year, but we've also learned a lot in the process of how we could actually be using research uptake and learning processes through a project cycle. And what we've realized is that, I mean, clearly from, uh, from a, for a long time, we've realized is that uh, IDS has been leading on it, but actually it requires a huge amount of investment and resources to adequately work with project partners. So it's been a, f it's a, been s a slightly singular process and hasn't really been as participatory as it could be. But that requires time, investment, resources to, be in, to actually have all the project partners involved right from the offset. So actually engaging with you know, not just our Ghanaian partners, but the ones in Kenya and the ones in Mozambique. Um, of course, this, this is just one of the challenges that we faced because not everybody's used to using participatory approaches in their work. So it's about also kind of creating an opportunity to maybe develop, not develop capacity per se, but try to use different approaches in a, in a dynamic way that allows <coughs> different types of people to engage with it and to be comfortable with the use of participatory approaches. Um, of course, you know, some of the case study issues evolved as the research unfolded. And that also was quite challenging because it meant that we continuously had to adapt the types of learning outcomes you were looking for and the types of processes we should be using. Of course, by design, the outputs from a research emerge and are informed by the process. And that means that we continuously need to have appropriate skills to be able to do that. So for example, in the in development of training packs, well, we had to find, we had to speak to the right people to be able to build our own capacity to do training packs. Um, if we wanted to do videos, well, do we have somebody in-house who can actually support us in the development of videos? So these are all, you know, even uh, participatory kind of approaches, we need to be able to understand how to do them ourselves. So there's a continuous learning process, and it also means that you need to have the right types of skills to do something like this. They are quite specialized um, in uh, skills to have. Of course, we continuously need to examine who we're trying to target all our outputs to. So just the assumption that it's for policy makers and policy advisors is fairly limited. It requires a little bit more thinking of who those policy makers are, who those advisors are, how do they access information? Are they going to be sitting, I remember Tom Tanner kind of uh, one day pointing out that actually will it be a policy maker sitting ironing his clothes watching a video or will it be somebody actually sitting at their desk and reading a pu publication? Will it be somebody who's actually going to be doing something else and listening uh, to audio podcasts? cost, there's so many different ways that people actually engage with content. Um, so uh, hopefully um, this will kind of given you a little bit of a, an overview of the process that we've undertaken in collaboration with the researchers. Um, and there's been a lot learned and we're looking forward to actually engaging more with the partners to be able to bring some rich um, <coughs> learning um, through the synthesis paper. Thank you, Fatima. Now, a round of questions. I think we can receive questions also from cyberspace if, if there are people who are actually, we haven't received any, but uh, you're most welcome, those who are watching us uh, uh, online, please uh, send uh, your questions and they will appear miraculously on an iPad in front of me. But uh, any questions in here? We have a roving microphone and questions to the panelists. 